Well, ladies and gentlemen, I must be doing something right because the kind people at Squarespace have come back to sponsor this video and indeed a few others to come in the next few months. So today I'm going to show you how it's relatively easy to make edits or changes using my own website, which runs via Squarespace. So here I was previously using buttons to link through to various pages full of pictures, but this was beginning to look a bit clunky and uneven. So I've decided I'm going to use just text links instead. So you can see here I'm putting in the appropriate text link and then copying the link straight out of the old button, which is easy enough and putting it back in to each line of text as appropriate as a new link. Now I could go and find the page, etc., but it recognizes internal website links just as well as it recognizes external links. So since the link is there, you know, copy, paste in, click. Now in that case, I actually missed hitting uh, apply properly. So uh, obviously putting in the Regia Marina there. And then because there's no link line under it, I'm like, ah, right, Marina Nationale didn't work properly. Great, try again. A few seconds later, it's in, fantastic. And now I can just remove the other buttons and it reformats those. So I've got three more buttons left, which I'll do later. And now I just check, do the links actually work? Yes, they do. There's some glorious battleships and other vessels of the Marine Nationale. Go back to Naval Photos, check another one. And there's the High Seas Fleet, or at least a portion of it. And that's how easy it is to change part of your site's formatting if you so desire. So if you want to build your own website for naval purposes or indeed any other, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to go, if you choose to do that, get, go to squarespace.com forward slash Drakinophil as shown above to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and on with the show. So there are a few sure ways to start either a fight or an argument in an environment where there's at least two people who happen to like naval history present. Some of them are slightly more obvious. You know, was Bismarck sunk or was it scuttled? Others perhaps require a little bit more of a refined palette. And somewhere in the middle, there's the argument between HMS Hood and USS Iowa. And are they battleships or battle cruisers? Or more specifically, are they fast battleships or battle cruisers? Because the one thing everyone can agree on is they're not conventional battleships. So we're going to take a look at that today. And we're going to do that by looking at what defines a battle cruiser. And there are multiple ways of going about that. And as we look through each way of defining a battle cruiser, we'll see if that particular measurement measures up against either the Iowa or the Hood. And if it does, well, that lends support to the idea they're battle cruisers. And if it doesn't, well, that lends support to the idea that they are fast battleships. Because, well, the definition of a fast battleship is relatively simple, isn't it? It's like a battleship, only quicker. Uh, but more on that later. Anyway, let's look first at the design mission role for battle cruisers rather than to trying to define battle cruisers themselves by some kind of physical measurement, which we'll come to later. In this case, at least in my view, there are four generations of battle cruiser that were either built or started to be built. The first generation consists of the Invincible and Indefatigable class. The second generation consists of what you would loosely call the Splendid Cats, and pretty much the entirety of the German production of battle cruisers. The third generation is basically Hood. The fourth generation consists of the G3s, Lexingtons, and Amagis. And there's a few random outliers like the Courageous class, which don't really fit anybody's definitions. Large light cruiser it might as well be something you stick on them. And then you also have Renown and Repulse, which are a bit of a blend between the first and second generations as designed, but as they are finally completed, they actually pretty much slot quite neatly into the second generation category. So, why have I split them that way? Well, the first generation, the Invincibles and the Indefatigables, are mostly cruiser killers. They are 
effectively armoured cruiser hulls with battleship grade guns. Indeed, that is exactly how the initial design studies panned out. Fisher asked for the hull of Minotaur, which was the last British armoured cruiser class, and two different design options were presented, one with a multiplicity of 9.2 inch guns and the other with 12 inch guns. Both of them technically fulfilling the idea of a dreadnought armoured cruiser, which is what they were called at the time. The 9.2 inch version is basically what the Germans thought that the British were building, and hence you ended up with Blücher. And that was a dreadnought armoured cruiser in the sense that the dreadnought was a ship that unified its main battery and didn't have much else apart from a few anti-torpedo boat guns. And the 9.2 inch version would also have had a unified main battery with a few anti-torpedo boat guns. The 12 inch version was of course something of a twist on the concept because it was an armoured cruiser hull with dreadnought battleship scale armament which is not what people have been expecting but that's what came through. Now... There is often some argument as to what the precise purpose of the Invincibles, and the Indefatigables for that matter, actually was. And some of this stems from the fact that armoured cruisers had a bit of an identity crisis going on as well. In smaller navies, armoured cruisers were quite often backups to the battleships in the battle line, because those smaller navies just didn't have the numbers of battleships necessary to form a whole battle line. You saw this, at, for example, at the Battle of Tsushima. In other navies, armoured cruisers were the battle line because they flat out couldn't afford battleships or they could only afford one of them. So, for example, the Spanish in the Spanish-American War had a battle line that was, in terms of what actually fought, led by armoured cruisers because they only had a single pre-general battleship, the Palayo, which didn't actually see any combat. And then you have something like, say, the Greco-Turkish Wars, also at this period, where the Greeks didn't have any pre-dreadnought battleships. They had the Hydra-class ironclads, but the only modern major capital combatant they had was the Georgios Averov, which was an armoured cruiser that ended up being pressed into a battleship role and indeed fighting other battleships. But the role of the armoured cruiser in other navies was somewhat different. In navies that could afford, and did afford, sufficient battleships, i.e. France, Germany, Russia to an extent, Britain of course, and latterly the USA, the armoured cruiser was not expected to fight in the battle line at all. The armoured cruiser was expected to, in major battle conditions, form part of the fleet screen, but that evolved out of the fact that the armoured cruiser initially had been designed and conceived to be a foreign station flagship or a squadron leader with the idea being that it was big enough and powerful enough to destroy anybody else's cruisers out on foreign stations and thus being a big and impressive vessel that could act as a flagship as well and obviously protect your own cruisers from enemy cruisers and then once that mission was accomplished or considering that a fair number of them were built Whilst some armoured cruisers were doing that, other armoured cruisers could be back with the fleet, where they would use that same power and endurance against enemy cruisers in order to crush the enemy fleet screen and allow your own fleet screen to come through. If they had any role in these larger navies in the battle line itself, it would be as a harrying force towards the end, because they were faster than the average battleship, so in theory they could chase down damaged ships that perhaps your own battleships couldn't, or finish off wallowing damaged battleships, thus allowing your main fleet to press on and attack the more intact enemy battleships. But their primary role in larger fleets was not to tangle with enemy battleships. That's what the big fleets had their own battleships for. And the Invincibles and the Indefatigables were built in the world's largest navy. Their primary purpose was actually to free up other armoured cruisers, because one of the big concerns was that as the rise of the German fleet, which started in the pre-dreadnought era, forced the British to concentrate their fleet more and more at home, they couldn't have battleships overseas, the way that they had done before as foreign station flagships, and it was also looking like they couldn't even have their bigger, more modern armoured cruisers overseas either, and certainly not in the numbers that they would need to counteract various commerce raiding cruisers, which were their main worry and which an armoured cruiser was perfectly capable of dealing with. 
the proliferation of enemy armoured cruisers was also a smaller concern, but the initial idea behind the battle cruiser was that it was faster than the enemy cruisers. Bear in mind, if it had only had to harry enemy battleships, then it could be slower than enemy cruisers in the way that an armoured cruiser was slightly slower than a protected cruiser. But no, the battle cruiser, or dreadnought armoured cruiser at the time, had to be faster even than a protected cruiser because it had to be able to hunt down and kill any enemy cruisers. The concept thus being that because it was big enough, powerful enough, and had armour enough to withstand pretty much any cruiser weapon, armoured or protected, a single battle cruiser could then go out and hunt down and destroy a fair number of enemy commerce raiders, whereas smaller, slower, or less well-protected cruisers might e either be able to cover a smaller area, or if they were faster protected cruisers, they could find and catch enemy cruisers and kill them, but they might then need to return to base for reload and repair, because they might have taken a bit of beating themselves, whereas a battle cruiser could just go from kill to kill to kill with no problems at all. As the concept advanced, Fisher would then add that yes, perhaps once this role was done, the battle cruisers could return to the battle fleet, because fundamentally everyone looked at the specs of what was going to be the Invincibles and realised, yeah, that'll mop up enemy cruisers pretty quickly, as indeed would be proved at the Falkland Islands. So once that mission was accomplished, what do you do with these things? Well, as I said, Fisher said, well, yeah, they can come back, they can be part of the battle fleet, not part of the battle line, but part of the fleet, part of the fleet screen. Obviously, they'll do fairly well beating up enemy cruisers in a fleet screen role just as well as they did overseas. And then if the enemy runs away, we can chase them down and, you know, cruisers and destroyers will torpedo the enemy ships and the battle cruisers might be able to cripple the enemy ships with gunfire. Or if the enemy is retreating beaten rather than just running away at first, then the battle cruisers have the firepower to help finish off the enemy ships, which will allow the rest of the battle fleet to press on and target the main enemy formation. But the, this was a secondary role that came after the initial cruiser killing spec. Fisher advocated for it, but he did advocate for it, even for him, in somewhat careful words. Could or may be able to, rather than should or, you know, this is their primary mission. So that was an adaptation of the mission and an adaptation in a world where other battle cruisers didn't yet exist. And you can see this by the deployment of these battle cruisers in the immediate run up to and the early part of World War I. As more and more cruisers were recalled, Invincible, Inflexible, Indomitable and Indefatigable were all deployed to the Mediterranean, not kept in the Grand Fleet's battle line. HMS Australia, of course, belonged to the Australian Navy, so she was in the Pacific, and New Zealand was initially also planned to be deployed to the Pacific. As things turned out, plans did change slightly. New Zealand was recalled back to the UK before the start of the war, and Invincible, in need of a refit, was actually in the UK, come, having come back from the Mediterranean when the war started, which meant that she was then in a position to be sent south to fight Admiral von Spee at the Battle of the Falkland Islands. Interestingly, even Princess Royal, which was one of the three 13.5-inch armed battle cruisers in service at the start of the war, was also sent to fight von Spee, except not down to the Falklands. She was sent into the region of the Panama Canal in case the East Asia Squadron came there. So apart from New Zealand, Lion, and the newly commissioned Queen Mary, every single other battle cruiser that Britain possessed at the start of the First World War had either already been deployed on or was subsequently deployed to anti-cruiser missions. Again, not kept hanging around the Grand Fleet as some kind of ancillary battle line. It was only once the high seas were purged of most German major surface raiders that all the battle cruisers ended up being recalled and ending up back in the Grand Fleet. And even then, one or two of them had time for some diversionary attacks on Gallipoli and so forth. So that's the first generation. Now, do either Hood or Iowa meet this categorization? Well, were they primarily designed to hunt enemy cruisers? No. 
Hood was designed primarily to fight enemy battlecruisers. And you could make an argument that the battlecruiser is a successor of the armoured cruiser, but the battlecruiser is very much its own class. Hood's original design was a little bit lacking in armour, but Hood, as she was built, and as she was launched, and as she saw service, was built and thought to be able to throw down with any capital ship out there, and that was her primary role. She was not supposed to be going down, hunting down enemy cruisers in the far reaches of the world. Similarly, USS Iowa was not designed to hunt down enemy cruisers. Granted, some of her design characteristics were built specifically with a mind to combating the Japanese Congo-class battle cruisers, which it was felt may be used in an attack on US carrier formations, but again, those are battle cruisers, and some people, in my mind erroneously, will call them fast battleships. But if they're right, well then it's a it's a ship that's designed to fight other battleships, so definitely not a crew designed to fight cruisers of any description. And of course, I was also built with that speed to help escort carriers. But when you look at their role in terms of battle line, Hood when factored into the British interwar battle line, was considered to be a full battle line unit, not something that would be used for purely chasing down enemy ships in an advantageous position for Hood. And likewise, the Iowa class were not designed to sit back and be a secondary part of the US battle line. They were, if anything, designed to lead it. So neither Hood nor the Iowa class fall into the first generation of battle cruisers by definition. So what about the second generation, the Splendid Cats and the German battle cruisers? And once they're completed in their final forms in the 1919-1920 period, Renown and Repulse. Well, these ships have a primary mission as a fleet screen against similar foes plus a degree of the previous described missions for the Invincibles and Indefatigables. But all of these ships were designed with now a consciousness that other battle cruisers existed. Of course, the Germans started off with Von der Tann, aware of Invincible and her sisters and half-sisters, and the British started building Lion, Queen Mary, etc., at a point when they realised that the Germans were building their own battle cruisers. Now, Fisher had wanted the Indefatigables to be something like a prototype line as well, but he didn't get the chance or the permission to do so, but that's by the by. Anyway, so what's the difference between these ships and the first generation of battle cruiser? Well, broadly it comes down to armour. Whilst they do have, in the case of the Splendid Cats, slightly larger guns, that's more a case of just keeping up with the current grade of battleship armament, not specifically a measure to fight enemy battle cruisers, but the armor levels are significantly increased. Speed creeps up a little bit as well, but again, this is more a case of just technology progressing. The Germans, however, are looking at their ships and thinking, right, well, if we're going to fight ships with 12-inch guns, we need armor that gives us at least a modicum of protection against 12-inch guns, and the British are kind of doing the same thing, except, of course, they're initially looking at Moltke, Stadlitz, Goben, Von der Tann, etc., with 11 inch guns, and thinking, okay, we need armour that will give us a modicum of protection against those weapons. And given that the British thought that they'd be firing at a longer distance than the Germans did, the 9 inch armour of the Splendid Cats makes a degree of sense there. Now, on both sides, it is marginal that these armour schemes provide protection against fully working shells from the guns they're expecting to face. But it is there, and of course the German ships have thicker armour, in part because they're expecting to face large guns, but also in part because their role has shifted not just into a fleet screen and scouting fleet element, but also more specifically into being expected to actually take a formal place in the line of battle should circumstances arise, whereas with the British second-gen battle cruisers, they're still not expected to be fully battle line role, this is still the role of the main battleships, but their emphasis on being able to harm enemy capital ships, and that includes battleships and battle cruisers, is coming a little bit more to the fore. So, do Iowa or Hood fall into this second generation class? Are they expecting to fight other 
battle cruisers and perhaps enemy battleships. Well, in on the initial face of it, yes, they they might begin to verge in this direction. Hood and the Admiral class in general were initially designed to counter the Mackensons, which the British thought would be armed with 15-inch guns. So they were designed to fight other battle cruisers. They were designed to be in the fleet screen. But as built, as we mentioned earlier, Hood was seen as part of the battle line, not an ancillary to it. And when you look at Iowa and her sisters, well, yes, they were built to counter enemy battle cruisers, i.e. the Congos. But again, as mentioned with the first gens, they were fully expected to be an integral part of the US battle line, not a useful addition to it if absolutely necessary. Bearing in mind, even the Germans didn't necessarily want to put their battle cruisers in the battle line, but they thought with their numerical disadvantage they might have to, whereas the Iowas were always seen as part of the front and centre element of a US fleet if they were going to go toe-to-toe with an enemy, enemy battle fleet. So there are some doctrinal similarities between Hood and Iowa and second generation battle cruisers, but not completely. Now, the third generation of battle cruiser is not really worth doing a comparison for because the third generation of battle cruiser, at least in my definition, is defined by Hood um, as f- completed. So, comparing Hood with Hood is uh, yes, well, Hood is Hood. Well, well done, congratulations, slow hand clap. Um, <laughs> and comparing Iowa with Hood directly is something which we will come to a little bit later on. Now, that then skips us forward to the fourth generation. And the fourth generation is the most confused because it consists of the G3s, the Lexingtons and the Amagis, all of which were built to very, very, very different specifications. The G3s are, in many cases, argued to be actual straight-up fast battleships, given that, that their armour and firepower and speed makes them competitive in this environment. Whereas the Lexingtons have great firepower, even greater speed, but their armour harks almost all the way back to... In fact, it does hark all the way back to the first-generation battlecruisers, in that it's only really proof against cruiser gunfire at longer ranges, and it would not stand much of a chance in a battle line unless it managed to get the first hits in. It's basically a glass cannon. And then the Amagis sit at an awkward point in between in that they also have uh, fairly powerful armament. All three ships have 16-inch guns. The Amagis have the most 16-inch guns, but their armour, as I said, sits in this rather awkward intermediate stage where it's it's proof against pretty much any cruiser gun down to a relatively speaking close range, but it's still not going to stop a contemporary battlecruiser or battleship shell at anything other than extreme angles, whereas the G3s would. Uh, But it has a good turn of speed. So comparing Hood or Iowa to these, you know, again, is a relatively pointless exercise on two grounds. One, um, none of those ships were actually completed as battlecruisers, Lexington um, and Akagi and Saratoga, of course, being completed as aircraft carriers. The G3 is not being completed at all. Um, Amagi herself falling victim to an earthquake and so on and so forth. So none of them actually saw service and comparing the Hood and the Iowas to any one of them would lead to massive disparities compared to if you compared them to another. And indeed, comparing all three against each other just in and of itself is a little bit of a tangled mess. So what we've discovered so far is that Hood and Iowa don't fit the definitions of the first generation of battlecruisers. They tick some of the notional boxes for the second generation of battle cruisers, with Hood perhaps ticking more than Iowa, and the third and fourths we can't really do a comparison for. So we can then look at some other definitions of how you define a battle cruiser. Well, one of the definitions, which I don't consider to be a valid one, is a ship armed with capital ship scale weaponry, but which is not armoured against its own guns. Now, that might seem a fairly sensible way of defining a battle cruiser, except for the fact that Hood was designed to be protected against her own guns, G3 was designed to be protected against her own guns, 
pretty much all the German battlecruisers were designed to be protected against their own guns. The Splendid Cats perhaps less so, admittedly, and the Invincibles definitely not. But as you can see, there is therefore this huge split where half the battlecruisers that were actually built don't actually fit to the definition of battlecruisers being ships that aren't armoured against their own guns. So we'll throw that definition out. And before anybody asks, I didn't forget about the Congos, but the Congos are so similar to the later Splendid Cats like Tiger, at least at the time of their construction, that you can basically take pretty much all the arguments made about the Queen Mary and Tiger and copy paste them for the Congos so save time didn't really talk about them all that much. Another problem with this contention is that the North Carolinas were originally supposed to be built with 14 inch guns they had armor designed accordingly but they were actually completed with 16 inch guns which meant that the at the expected battle ranges the North Carolinas were not armed against their own guns which if we accepted this definition would make the North Carolinas battle cruisers which, again, is not something that anybody has ever seriously proposed. Now, beyond that, there are a few other definitions which may have a degree of validity. The first one is the weakest, which is actually the post-World War I British definition, which is that a battlecruiser is a ship armed with capital ship-grade weapons that is faster than 25 knots. And this is one of the reasons why specific national definitions of certain ship classes are not something I tend to pay too much attention to. Because one, it leads to all sorts of confusion. Because if one nation puts a very specific definition on things and another nation doesn't, then direct comparison might become very difficult, even though the two ships theoretically are actually relatively similar in capability. And secondly, a lot of these definitions are made up for either reasons that become rapidly obsolete or are very, very political and therefore are far less objective. So if a battlecruiser is defined as a ship with capital ship grade weaponry that's faster than 25 knots, then yes, in theory, Hood and Iowa are both battlecruisers because they both carry capital ship guns and they can both move faster than 25 knots. However... That means basically every capital ship built after the mid-1920s is a battlecruiser because the King George V's, the South Dakotas, the North Carolinas, the Yamatos, they're all faster than 25 knots and they all carry battleship-scale weaponry, but no one in their right mind calls them battlecruisers, albeit that design documents for the King George V class did initially call them battlecruisers and design documents for Vanguard called it a fully armoured battlecruiser at points before you know sanity prevailed and people said no these are capital ships and more specifically battle ships so we discard that one what's the next definition well battleships are the ships that fight other battleships ships that are not designed to do that are therefore by definition battle cruisers well okay that's an interesting one considering that the germans very explicitly had battle cruisers, but also very explicitly and expected them to quite likely be able to fight enemy battleships in the battle line, albeit maybe not do quite as well as the regular capital ships. And well, if we examine that categorization, what was Hood designed to fight? Well, initially German battle cruisers, but as built, expected to fight any enemy capital ship. The US Navy rated her as more capable than any capital ship in the U.S. battle line in the late 1910s, with the questionable exception of the Colorados, and even then they caveated that with the fact that the Colorados couldn't run away from Hood, whereas Hood could choose to decline a battle with the Colorado if, if Hood felt that it was not on her terms or in her best interests. And as we mentioned, the Iowas were very, very definitely designed to fight other battleships, although they their speed was given to them as part of an effort to help them kill Congos, which were, let's face it, still battle cruisers in any sensible definition of the term. So this argument goes away as well. And then lastly, we have a definition that is quite interesting is relatively short but still comprehensive and actually serves quite well in the realm of battlecruiser de definition 
which is that a battle cruiser carries the same armament as the contemporary battleship of its nation. It just has slightly fewer of those guns, and in exchange for that it is faster and has slightly less armour. Now this is something more of a rule of thumb than a specific definition, but it is quite a useful one because when you look at the entirety of World War I battlecruiser production, this pretty much bears out. The Invincibles and Indefatigables are contemporary with the British 12-inch gun battleships, and they're armed with 12-inch guns. They just have eight of them instead of the 10 or 12 found on British battleships at the time. They are about four to five knots faster, and they have considerably less armour. Then you look at the Splendid Cats, and they have 13.5-inch guns. Contemporary British battleships have 13.5-inch guns, except they have 10, the battlecruisers have 8, the battlecruisers are faster, but have less armour. Renown and Repulse, actually both as designed and initially built, and then as rather rapidly refitted, again, contemporary British battleships for them are the Revenge class, and the Queen Elizabeths to a certain degree, with 8 15-inch guns. Renown and Repulse have 6 15-inch guns, are faster and less well protected. The German battlecruisers are mostly the same as well. They have, in the first cases, 11-inch guns, but fewer of them, slightly less armour, but somewhat faster. And then with the Deflingers, 12-inch guns, same as their contemporaries, slightly less armour, but faster. The only slight area where this doesn't work is some of the intermediate German battlecruisers like Seydlitz, because by that point German battleships had moved on to 12-inch guns, whereas Seydlitz still has 11-inch. But since contemporary German battleships of the period include things like Nassau, which did have 11-inch guns, and the 11-inch guns on the latter German battlecruisers were a more advanced model, and there's only an inch in difference in calibre, you can just about fit them in and saying they had battleship calibre guns, even if it wasn't necessarily their direct contemporaries. So this is why it's a rule of thumb, not a precise definition. Congo as well. Contemporary battleship for the Japanese is the Fusos. The Fusos have 12 14-inch guns, the Congos have 8, but they are faster than the Fusos with less armour. And this even holds true with most of the fourth generation of battle cruisers, at least as they were originally desired for. Lexington ticks the boxes perfectly. It has the same 16-inch guns as the South Dakota 1920s design, but is faster and less well-armoured. The Amagis have the faster and less well-armoured bit dialed in, and they have the same calibre of guns, the 16.1-inch, but they have an identical main battery to the Tosas. 10 guns apiece. This is kind of where the fourth generation starts to break down because everyone was, as mentioned, taking their battlecruisers in different design directions. The Japanese, with the following design, the keys, were trying to actually combine the two into one, which, interestingly enough, is what the Germans had been thinking about doing had World War I continued further on. The G3s initially tick the boxes perfectly. Well, their predecessors, the I-3s, K-3s, etc., did, as they were designed to carry 18-inch guns, but faster and with slightly less armour. Although, depending on whether you'd gone with K-2, K-3, I-3, I-2, etc., compared to the various 2s and 3 designs that the battleships were coming up with, it might have had identical numbers of guns, like the Amagi Tosa did, or it might have had one less, or it might even have had one more um, if for some reason they'd gone for a two design for the battleships and a three design, i.e. twin turrets and triples, for the battle cruiser. Nonetheless, let's see if we can apply that rule to Hood and Iowa and see do they fit this definition. Well, does Hood's armament have the same caliber as the nearest contemporary battleship design? Queen Elizabeth's and Revengers. Yes, 15-inch guns. However, it doesn't have less of them the way that Renown and Repulse do. It has the same number of them, eight guns. It is faster, so that's box ticked. But does it have less armour? No, the thickness is fractionally less, 12 inches as opposed to 13, but it's angled to give the same protective value. So it has the same battery as 
the contemporary battleship. It has the same level of protection. It's just faster. So it falls outside this rule of thumb. And then let's look at Iowa, either as designed with 16-inch 45s or as equipped with 16-inch 50s. She is armed with the same caliber. Great. But she has the same number of guns as the South Dakotas, nine. As actually built with a 16-inch 50, she has more powerful 16-inch guns than the South Dakotas. She has effectively exactly the same armor scheme. She's just a little bit faster. So Iowa also falls out of this definition of battlecruiser. It doesn't fit closely enough. So let's take a couple of moments to consider a few possibilities, a few might-have-beens. So Iowa gets two, Hood gets one. So if Hood was being designed in the same way that the rule of thumb suggests, what should she have had, or could she have had? Well, if the contemporary battleship has eight 15-inch guns, then Hood should have six, reduced by one turret. She should have less armor, and she should be faster. Well, as we mentioned, she already was faster, but... What has six 15-inch guns, less armor, and is faster than a Revenge class? Oh, right, yes, it's the Renowns. So, that's the Battlecruiser by the rule of thumb. Now, Iowa. What would Iowa have if she was following the rule of thumb as compared to a South Dakota class? And this I mentioned in a dry dock video, I believe, and also in, when talking about the Alaska class. Iowa, in theory, should have had six 16-inch guns. They can be 45s or 50s. Doesn't make too much odds. And be faster, which she already was, but have less armor. So effectively a 16-inch gun version of a Renown. But that's not what she had. So she's not fitting the Battlecruiser definition there. Now, the fun part comes is when you compare her to the Montanas. Because what exactly is the contemporary battleship is sometimes difficult to pin down. For the Japanese, with the Kongos and Fusos, it's fairly easy. Those were the only two classes of capital ship they were building at remotely the same time period. In World War I, again, it's relatively easy because both the Germans and the British, for the most part, were building battleships and battlecruisers in the same years. Although, towards the end, it does get a little bit harder to define with the Germans. Renown, Repulse, and Hood are a little bit harder to point at because the British stopped building battleships, but their designs were maybe only a year or two removed from the Revenges, so comparisons can still be made. With Iowa, though, the South Dakotas are the closest contemporary battleships as built, uh, both Iowa and South Dakota obviously being ships that were in existence, in commission, and actually served. But the authorizations and the time of laying down is just a fraction removed. So the South Dakotas are basically the previous years, the financial year 3940 battleships, with the last ship being laid down in February 1940, that being USS Alabama. Whereas the Iowas are authorized in financial year 4041, at least initially, so they immediately follow on from the South Dakotas, which normally would be fine for contemporary battleship comparison purposes. But you then also have the Montanas. And the five Montanas were actually authorized before Illinois and Kentucky, or simultaneously, depending on exactly how you look at the figures. So you could argue that the Montanas are potentially slightly more contemporary to the Iowas than the South Dakotas are, even though it's all very close. Now, the Montanas were never actually completed. So in real-world comparison terms, they don't enter into the equation. But if you look at the Montanas and assume that maybe they were completed, or maybe even use them just as a design general guide as to what the US Navy was thinking of in terms of advancing its standard fast battleship design, well... What are the characteristics of the Montana? 28 knots, so very similar to the South Dakota's pre preceding 27. 16.1-inch belt inclined, and 12 16-inch guns. So if we've already discussed the comparison between Iowa and South Dakota, but if we compare Iowa to Montana, 
Well, if we take Montana as the battleship and we say, right, it should have the same caliber armament, but less faster, but less armor. Well, Iowa has nine guns versus 12. So same, same guns, but fewer. It has less armor, 12 inch inclined versus 16 and a bit inch inclined. And it is faster, 33-ish knots versus 28 for the Montanas. So it would seem that the Mon compared to the Montanas, the Iowas fit the rule of thumb for battle cruiser absolutely perfectly. So does this make the Iowas battle cruisers? Uh, who does kind of maybe fit in with the battle cruiser definition in the second generation? Iowa not quite as much, but almost. And here we seem to have proof that maybe Iowa does fit the battle cruiser role. And since everybody tended to call. Cool, Hood a battle cruiser? Are they both battle cruisers? Well, as I said, this is just a rule of thumb. It's not binding. And now comes the crux of the argument, at least for me. Now, bear in mind, obviously, this is my opinion based on the evidence which I've outlined, but feel free to disagree and argue about it in the comments. I tend to go more by what was the actual design specification for the ship, because we can look at classes of ship like battleships and battle cruisers as a whole, but then why don't we actually look at how the individual design spec for the individual ship we're looking at compares to those general terms? And bearing in mind, obviously, we have the fast battleship comparison, which is literally just battleship except faster. And you can make an argument that both Hood and Iowa fit that category. So, what was the design spec for Hood? They looked at the preceding battleship class, the QE Revengers, and they said, in its ultimate form, uh, as opposed to the initial Admiral form, that they wanted the same level of protection as the previous battleship, and they wanted it to carry the same firepower as the previous class of battleship. The only thing they wanted changed was they wanted all of this to be carried at the speed of a battle cruiser. Now, obviously, as mentioned earlier, this protection did take a slightly different form on the hood in terms of a 12-inch inclined belt as opposed to a 13-inch vertical belt, but the overall level of main belt protection was the same. The firepower, as we mentioned, eight 15-inch guns, was the same. It was just faster, designed to kill enemy battlecruisers, but with its protection levels, it could stand in line and deal with enemy battleships. Now, let's take a look at Iowa's design specification. They looked at the previous class of battleships, the South Dakotas, and they said we want the same levels of protection, which it had pretty much identically. Then they asked for the same amount of firepower, which they also had, and then was subsequently upgraded to 16-inch 50s from 16-inch 45s, but as design spec, it was supposed to have an identical a level of firepower to the South Dakotas, it was just taking everything a lot faster. And it was designed to kill enemy battlecruisers, the Congos, but also quite happily deal with any battleships it might encounter. So, what do you notice? Those design specs are actually functionally identical. Previous class of battleship, same firepower, same protection, just quicker, with an eye towards killing enemy battlecruisers, but also entirely capable and expected to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy battleships and come out on top. So what this tells me is that whatever term or definition we're going to use for one should be applied to the other, because they are basically the same ship, only separated by 20 plus years. Yes, they may well have been called various things in their lifetime, and yes, they may still be called various things after the fact, but I think there's some fairly clear evidence there that whatever term is used, it should be the same. In my personal opinion, no, I don't think the Iowas were battle cruisers. They don't fit any of the mission or rule of thumb definitions of a battle cruiser, unless you compare them to the Montanas, which were never built. And even then, that's a very technical argument. And Hood, while she almost fits one of the definitions, also doesn't actually fit any of the main definitions of battlecruiser. But what they do both fit 
is the definition of fast battleship, and hence I ref will refer to both the Iowa class and HMS Hood as fast battleships, unless in Hood's case I'm making reference to some kind of historical document or definition which people were using at the time, in which case you, know, you have to use whatever it is that they were calling them at the time because you are reporting on history. But of course, if you want to call Hood a battlecruiser, you're perfectly at liberty to. All I'd ask is that you be consistent about what you end up calling a battlecruiser. Now, if you think there's other battlecruiser definition terms that I've missed out, let me know in the comments below. And of course, I'm looking forward to hearing what Ryan aboard Battleship New Jersey has to say, uh, because of course he did promise to hold off on his comments until I've done this video. So, Ryan, it's over to you. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.